Hi, my name is Danielle Brissette and I get to be the curator of collections here at San Felipe de Austin State Historic Site, where we're pleased to be bringing you another installment of our History at Night series sponsored by our friends of San Felipe de Austin State Historic Site. Uh, today, we are incredibly lucky to have not just one, but two Texas wonders joining us. Uh, we're going to have Mike Vance interviewing Dr. Stephen Harden about his reflections on early Texas through a career in writing and reflecting on many of the things that have happened in the colonial and republic and statehood eras of time. Uh, so I'd like to take a minute to introduce our uh, interviewer, as opposed to our interviewee, uh, Mr. Mike Vance, uh, in addition to a former career as a stand-up comedian, a sometimes vintage baseball star, uh, a normal baseball star as well. Uh, Mike is a huge part of Night Heron Media, which produces books and videos about Texas history, arts, and culture. He is the current interim director of the Brenham Heritage Museum, uh, and is working on his eighth book, which is going to be entitled Getting Away with Bloody Murder, a uh, historic true crime novel focused uh, right around the turn of the century. And uh, that should be coming out, I believe, was that in January? January. January of 2022. Uh, so um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mike, to introduce Dr. Harden and get going on the questions. Great, thanks a bunch, Danielle. and. Uh... I've known Steve Harden for about 15 years, and I should say Dr. Stephen Harden. Um, I'll refer to him as Steve from here on in, and you can uh, Thank read you. His, Thank you very much. You can read his full name uh, there underneath his picture. Um, we met when uh, I interviewed him in what ultimately ended up being a coming up on an eight-part uh, video series uh, of documentaries about Texas history. Uh, we're going to be today talking about uh, Stephen's uh, book work, and he has seven books that he has written uh, or edited, and uh, that's going to be the focus of our, our talk. The picture that's on the screen here, I got to start with that, Steve. What uh, You're wearing a bear there. What is that? Actually, it's a buffalo, Mike. It's a buffalo coat. Uh, yeah, I, I own a, a buffalo coat, you know, as one does. Uh, I, I'm a reenactor, and I have a good friend, Mike Boyd, uh, in Victoria. I lived in Victoria for 17 years. Mike and I became good friends. And Mike is a Hollywood costume designer. And uh, he had done a made-for-TV movie with Steven Spielberg called Into the West. Mm and had made for that show, uh, a, 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 well, more than, more than a few buffalo coats. And uh, he, he mentioned it to me and he said, would you, you know, would have any interest? And I said, well, Mike, you're not gonna have any in my size. And he said, actually, I, I think we do. So I went over and, uh, tried it on and it fit and uh, it uh, cost uh, so much money that I never told Deborah how much I paid for it. Uh, but uh, I love it. Uh, he's become part of our family. We call him Harry. Uh, it's rarely in Texas uh, cold enough uh, to wear it. But occasionally, maybe uh, once or twice, you know, when it's really, really cold, I've gone entire winters without taking Harry out of the closet. But it's always fun uh, when I do. Uh, and you find out real quick why Indians used to sleep under buffalo robes, because it's warm. It looks it. One of, I'm going to run down your books, uh, seven of them in chronological order here. And I will admit up front, there are a couple that I have not seen that I didn't realize that you had done. And that includes this very first one. Um, your first book was about the Texas Rangers. I've got to ask, um, there's been so much 
written about the the Texas Rangers. How did you arrive at this as your your first book subject? Well, interesting question, Mike. Uh, Iliad was the first one I wrote, but Texas Rangers was the first one I published. And uh, being a you know, 60s, 70s kid, I, I had grown up on the Osprey publications. Uh, I admired them and thought it would be neat to contribute to that series. I had done some magazine work uh, for the editor. And so I dropped him a line and just said, uh, yeah, and they have a, a series called the Elite Series, and each volume concentrates on an elite military unit, like Napoleon's Old Guard or uh, the 300 Spartans, something like that. So I said, would, would you be interested in, a, in an elite on the uh, Texas Rangers? And uh, he wrote back and he said, uh, yeah, we would. Uh, so he gave me a word limit, and it, and I knew that it would not be an exhaustive treatment. And I also knew that uh, most of the readership would be, I mean, it's an English press, it's they're, they're, they're out of Oxford. And uh, so I, this is a book about the Texas Rangers, an introduction. Uh, for people I had to assume knew absolutely nothing about the Texas Rangers. Uh, so uh, to, to the degree it succeeds, uh, I've had a number of people tell me that their kids really liked it. And I think it would be a good book, uh, you know, your first Texas Ranger book. Uh, it's lavishly illustrated both with original uh, plates and, uh, and photographs. Uh, a funny story about one of those photographs. I was talking about Frank Hamer. And of course, he's the guy who, who finally tracked down and killed Bonnie and Clyde. And uh, I included what has become a stock image of, of uh, Bonnie and Clyde. It's the one I'm sure you've seen it, Mike. She's brandishing a sawed off shotgun uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Barrow is recoiling as if, you know, it's a, they're all goofing for the camera. Well, that, that, was, that was published in the book. And, and when I, when I got the book from the publisher, I'm reading the caption. And it says, Bonnie Parker brandishing her sawn off shotgun. So immediately I get on the horn uh, and uh, call my editor and I said, What's, what's up with this sawn off shotgun? It's sawed off shotgun. He said, well, we checked with our editor and he assures us that uh, sawed off is bad grammar. So friends, if you read this book, please don't think I'm a blithering idiot. I know it's sawed off. But that's that's one of the pitfalls of working with a with an English editor. And I asked him. I said, "Well, do do you also would your editor have told you that uh, it, it it's Bronco Burster?" Uh, so, you know, I I knew they were going to spell neighbor weird. I knew they were going to spell color, but but sawn off shotgun is simply beyond the pale. You know? And I, I'm still embarrassed by that. Why they can't just speak American like we taught them to. I have well, to yeah. Um, let me, this Ranger book came out 30 years ago. And there's yeah. been a, a lot of scholarship 
about the Rangers, uh, particularly the 1915 um, in the valley uh, and along the, the border. Has your personal view of the Rangers uh, as a historian changed at all over 30 years? Uh, somewhat, yeah. Uh, good and ill. I, I, you know, I was attending a, a conference one time and uh, one of my woke colleagues was lambasting uh, the, uh, the Rangers uh, for their misdeeds and abuses, which is perfectly valid. I mean, nobody's uh, above reproach, but I thought it was uh, his, his criticisms were lacking context. And these were a bunch of college students. So during the question and answer session, I said, now you're college students, so I know you all have one of these. And if you would oblige me, would you take it out? And uh, would you Google the plan of San Diego? The plan of San Diego. And they did. And as you know, uh, the uh, plan of San Diego was a, and I use this term advisedly, a genocidal plan to kill all Anglo males north of the river over the age of 10. So it's not, I mean, that's, the, the Rangers got word of that. That's what they're reacting to. Uh, I'm always accused of being a reactionary, but I think I would have reacted to, to that. So it's not like a bunch of Texas Rangers uh, are sitting around the cantina and one of them suddenly says, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we oppress of uh, innocent Tejano ranchers. It was a response to a real threat. And, and people says, well, Steve, the plan of San Diego never materialized. I said, why do you think that is? You know, because the Texas Rangers were down there preventing it from happening. So um, yes, I'm, I'm not saying that there weren't abuses. I'm not saying that there weren't bad eggs, but I'm also saying uh, they had some justification. You mentioned Iliad, uh, Texian Iliad is, and we've talked about this before, um, your best known book, and I would assume the best selling. Uh, uh, far and away, far and okay. away, the best known, the best seller. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I've, I've sold over the years uh, some, somewhere uh, around uh, 30,000 copies of that book, in excess of 30,000 copies. Now, Stephen King will do that in a weekend. John Grisham <laughs> will do, but for a, uh, a nonfiction work of history, that's that's pretty good. It is. And what I'm especially, it was published in 1994 and uh, it's never been out of print, for which I'm extremely grateful for to University of Texas Press for uh, keeping the book in print that long. It's really the Bible of military history of the Texas Revolution, uh, I think. I don't think that's an overstatement. Um, well, you're very kind. Uh, you know, every time I open it up, I, I, I see things. I say, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd do I'd, I'd, way too much passive voice. Uh, you know, there, there are things that I'd change. Uh, I've but, never seen a file that I wouldn't go back and edit every yeah, time I open it. You, I know, think uh, yeah. you know, publication is, is such a, a, a boon to, to proofreading. Uh, but... Uh, 
but no, I, I you know, I, I still have people comment on Facebook. It's still a, yeah, it's far and away uh, my most popular. It's 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 not my personal favorite, but but people seem to like it after all these years, which is uh, enormously gratifying. It's a great comprehensive resource. Um, and a lot of the Texas Revolution military history is is well known. If you grow up in Texas, you get it in school, but there's a lot of it that's not so well known. And tell me, pick out, and I know it's, it's hard to pick, but uh, you may have a different answer four hours from now, but tell me about one of the turning points of that relatively short conflict uh, that people don't understand that they should. Well, you know, the the book began as my PhD dissertation at, at TCU. And uh, there, I knew there were books and good ones uh, uh, about the Alamo. I knew there were books and good ones uh, about San Jacinto. But what we were lacking, and I, I really couldn't believe that, that no one had taken this on, was a comprehensive soup to nuts narrative history of the entire Texas Revolution. And the glare of those shining moments had obscured uh, things like the Battle of Nueces crossing, the Battle of Concepcion, uh, the siege and storming of, uh, of Bayer. And uh, of course, you, you can't write a book about the Texas military history of the Texas Revolution without talking about the Alamo and San Jacinto. And I do. Uh, but uh, I, I thought and still think that if, if the book makes a contribution at all, it because it, it's, it's, it's because it tells the, the whole story. And even if the Alamo is all you're interested in, you really can't understand the significance of the Alamo if you don't know what comes before and after. And that's, that's what I tried to do. Uh, you, we were talking about turning points. I think uh, a, a turning point that's been overlooked uh, is the siege and storming of Bayer, which I, which I mean, that's, that's real important. But, uh, you know, in, in people's hurry to, to get on to the, you know, I, I, I'm a Texas history professor and I tell people I have a, a love-hate relationship with the Alamo. Of course, if you are a Texan, you are obliged to remember the Alamo. The problem being is that a lot of Texans remember the Alamo to the exclusion of everything else in their history. And uh, so, like I say, I have this, what I wanted to do was tell the story of the Texas Revolution uh, in its entirety, not just the Alamo, not just Goliad, not just San Jacinto. But, but even now I have, you know, friends who say, well, this, this is Steve Harden, you know, he wrote a book about the Alamo. And I just sort of sigh. Uh, you did, yes. and we'll get to that in a second, but uh, not this book. Um, up next, and, and we're gonna go through these and, and I, I wanna talk about some of the history behind them as we do. Sure. Um, the third one is one that you edited and you made the comment when we were talking earlier that you think this is your most obscure title? I'm sure it is because uh, Discovery Enterprise, uh, I don't even think they're in business anymore, Mike, but I'm sitting in my office uh, down at the Victoria College and I get a call. And this guy, I think he identifies himself as an editor with Discovery Enterprises. I I assume they're in New York City, but somewhere up north. And he said, we have this book series and we'll send you some so you can see. And uh, what they are is 
documents, uh, historical primary documents. And uh, what, what you would do is select the documents uh, that are illustrative of the period. And uh, you'd write a, a general introduction to the documents, about 10 pages. And you would write an introduction to each one of the, the primary accounts. And uh, that's pretty much it. And that's what we do. Could, could you do one of these for us? I said, well, if the money was right, uh, and why do you why do you pay a fellow for doing one of these? And uh, they said, well, normally we pay about seven hundred dollars. And I said, well, make it a thousand, and 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 maybe we'll have a deal. And even then, a thousand dollars wasn't a, a a lot of money. But I figure this is not going to take a lot of time. I can knock this out. And the thing about editing work is it always, always, always takes longer than you think it will. So I earned my $1,000. Oh, funny story about this book. Uh, I send them the manuscript and a couple of months pass and I, I, I get a cardboard box with, with, with books and I'm thumbing through it. And I believe it was Lamar's inaugural address. And what he had actually said is that uh, Texas was born in a Spartan spirit. But somehow uh, it got garbled. And in the book, it says Texas was born in a Satan spirit. And I just, I can't, I, I can envision myself being crucified by the daughters of the Republic of Texas. And so I call up my guy, the guy who had contact me. I said, I, this, this is, look, I, I, I sent you an electronic copy. Somebody had to change this. I now know it was probably autocorrect. But for whatever reason, uh, and he knew I was very upset, and uh, they uh, they did a whole new print run. But uh, I I still have some of the satanic editions. Have you have you put any of the satanic uh, editions up at some phenomenal price on? Uh, oh eBay? no, no! I hope <laughs> they never see the light of day, Mike. You know what they're good for, and I've done this on more than one occasion when I'm when I'm sending cash to people. I will put the cash in this book, so if it's open, people say, oh, just some dumb book, you know. But people get the book, their cash is inside, and uh, that's about all they're good for the the satanic editions. But I, you know, I I guess that. I haven't checked in a while. I don't even know if it's available on Amazon. I, I think Discovery Enterprises was bought out. I, you know, I don't even know if that book's in print. If, if you know, you, you know, were a completist and, and wanted uh, every book that uh, Steve Harden ever wrote, that you know, but uh, yeah, you don't see that one a lot. It's pretty obscure. Obscure is the word. Well, you know, for a thousand bucks, I think they can contact you and get a satanic uh, version of that. Uh, well, you that. know, it would probably have sell better than it did originally. <laughs> you know, um, maybe maybe we could sell them to the black, uh, you know, fingernail crowd. You know, uh, the uh, did I ever did tell you that I interviewed uh, or not interviewed, but I I did a, a TV spot with Ozzy Osbourne. No, I did. Yeah, that's a perfect lead in to the next book, by the way. <laughs> um, that was one of the more bizarre, you know, uh, days of my life. But I got paid well for it, you know. And was that Alamo related? It was. It was. Uh, he and his son, Jack, were doing a show uh, for the History Channel. 
and uh, they revisited the, the Alamo. And remember, um, in his uh, wild days, uh, Ozzy, while he was drunk out of his mind, and he, I'm, I'm not betraying any secrets, right. urinated not on the Alamo. I hear this all the time. Ozzy Osbourne urinated on the Alamo. He didn't. He urinated on the Alamo cenotaph, which is almost worse. But uh, he was rounded up and taken downtown and, and barred from playing in San Antonio uh, for many years. But uh, he made amends. He he gave a generous donation to the to the daughters. And uh, this was his kiss and makeup tour. So they invited me to come down to give Jack and Ozzy a tour of the Alamo. And it was all very hush-hush. I was sworn to silence. Uh, because of course, he, when you're Ozzy Osbourne, you can't go any place. And uh, to, for me to give them this tour of the Alamo, we were gonna have to fly under the radar. Well, a San Antonio uh, city councilman let the cat out of the bag. And when we showed up down at the Alamo, there, it, man, it looked like the cast of, you know, the Ten Commandments. All these Ozzy people. And, I, you know, I've, I've, uh, Phil Collins is another rock star friend of mine. And you talk about, and I've, I've met some of Phil's fans, Ozzy's fans, are, are a whole different cast. Uh, we got, I was with uh, Ozzy's personal assistant. We were sitting in the car waiting for uh, Ozzy to arrive. And this lady, and she wasn't a girl. She was, she was a grown woman. She came up, she said, Ex excuse me, are, are you with Ozzy? And we said, well, yes. She says, well, uh, do, do you think he had signed my arm? I said, excuse me? He says, yeah, I want, I want Ozzy to sign my arm. And then I'm going to get a tattoo over his signature. So I'll always have it. And I said, well, uh, no, uh, I mean, we're here to, to shoot a, a documentary and I don't think Ozzy's going to have time to, to sign autographs or your arm or, or anything. And she said, you don't? I said, no, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. And she seemed very disappointed and, and I don't think it, it, it was, but it was... Uh, you know, it was the first time that I, I really got a sense of how these guys can't go anywhere without being mobbed. Uh, and I've got a picture somewhere of uh, me and Ozzy, you know. So, it was, yeah, that was one of the more bizarre, you know. I mean, as a historian, I've, uh, you know, it's taken me places that I, I could have never imagined. I've met people. I mean, I've... I've I've, I've flown on a, a private jet with Phil Collins, uh, but but uh, you know, uh, hanging out with uh, Ozzy and, and Jack Osborne was one of the uh, more bizarre uh, episodes. Well, your your Alamo book uh, from two thousand one was another British book. Well, and, it's so it's Osprey. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I had sworn I would never do another book with them because, frankly, I, I think uh, Osprey Publications uh, are exploitative of their authors. I believe uh, the relationship uh, between an author and publisher ought to be a partnership. And uh, if you write a book, at least this campaign series, uh, you get uh, $3,000. One-time payment, you never see a dime 
in royalties. And that's the deal. And everybody knows the deal going in. Now, let me also say that a lot of authors never see $3,000 in royalties. So, uh, but uh, I wanted to take uh, my wife uh, to uh, England. We have friends over there. And uh, I, I called this my England book. I, I did it for the money. And $3,000 would just about cover our, our plane tickets. And uh, so true to their pledge, uh, I got the $3,000 and I've never seen a dime of royalties. Uh, but, you know, my friends call it Iliad Light. But, uh, you know, I think it, it covers the same ground as Iliad. It's it, it, the name of the book is uh, the Alamo 1836 because of, that's no pun intended. That's what everybody remembers. And again, remember this is for an English audience. Uh, so I, you know, I think that book holds up. Uh, I like parts of it better than Iliad. You know, it's it's more concise. I get to the point uh, quicker. So. Uh, if you don't like to read, if you don't, uh, you know, want to take on something as large as Iliad, this is a, maybe a nice alternative. And, and again, it's a good introduction for young people. So, uh, yeah. As long as we're on the Alamo, around a few years after this, you ended up being the history advisor to the movie. Um, the yeah, album. the 2004 John Lee Hancock feature film, uh, The Alamo, uh, with uh, uh, I just remember, what's his, uh, uh, Thornton, what's his? Billy Bob. Billy Bob Thornton, yeah. Uh, probably most famous today for having Billy Bob Thornton and being a box office disaster, uh, which I, you know, nobody sets out to make uh, an unsuccessful movie. And I can testify that uh, everybody involved in that film, you know, put their heart and soul in it. And uh, I was, we were all devastated that people didn't respond to it. Uh, I've had since people watch it on a DVD and say, you know, Steve, I, I kind of liked it. I, I don't know why everybody, you know. Uh, I like it. Well, I, I do too, you know, and I, I know I'm not objective. But uh, it, when you're uh, a Hollywood historical advisor, the first thing uh, you have to understand is they don't have to take your advice. In fact, uh, they normally don't. But I also have to say that when I first met uh, John Lee Hancock, he said, I want this film to be as historically accurate as possible. Now, let me tell you what that means. First, it's got to work as a movie. And uh, to work as a movie will probably uh, condense the timeline. We may combine some characters, do things like that. And uh, I'm a historian, but I, I, I'm also a big movie fan. So I, I, I understood that. And I said, no, John, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm okay. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. And uh, also when you're a Hollywood uh, 
historical advisor, you have to understand what your role is. You're not trying to showcase your vision. You're trying to help the, the director realize his, his vision because ultimately movies are, are, are about the directors. And several times uh, he would come to me and, you know, I remember we were talking about, uh, you know, how, how did Crockett die? And I said, well, uh, I've, I've got my, I said, you've read Iliad, you, you know my take. Uh, but John, ultimately, uh, you're 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 going to have to decide what your take on the story is, and uh, you know my job is 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 to help you realize your vision of, of what happened there. So, uh, and I I really have no complaints uh, because every time I went to John uh, with a concern, uh, he always had a valid cinematic reason for not doing it that way. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, where, where he could, uh, he did, uh, it, 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 I read one review, some little teeny bopper film reviewer, and her comment was, this movie is too true to be good. <sighs> and that, that struck me to the heart because, you know, that made it sound like I was the reason <laughs> that the movie uh, bombed at the box office. If, if, if John hadn't listened to this, you know, crackpot historian guy, it would have been a better movie. Uh, maybe, maybe she was right. I don't know. I, you know, I still find myself thinking about, uh, you know, why don't people love that movie as much as, as I do? But I, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think sometimes movies can be a uh, economic failure and an artistic success. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, apparently Citizen Kane didn't do well when it was released in theaters. So it's a wonderful life didn't do well. So uh, I, I think over time, uh, and I wish people could see the movie we made because so much of that got left on the cutting room floor. Uh, oh. Yeah, so, but I, yeah, uh, my, my memories of uh, making that uh, are very positive, uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, I just, I'm so, you know, John Lee Hancock after he, he didn't, he didn't direct for eight years after that. And then his next movie was The Blind Side and the rest is history. Yeah. But, but, uh, you know, that town does not, uh, it's not uh, countenance failure. And, uh, Next book up is my favorite. I know it's your favorite. I know it's Brian McCauley, the site manager here at San Felipe de Austin. I, I know it's his favorite. Uh, and that's Texian Macabre. We're looking at what's not the cover. Of, of that that's book. right. That's right. Uh, when this book was in publication, uh, we were getting ready to put it in the catalog. And uh, I didn't have all of the artwork uh, from uh, my brilliant illustrator and friend, Gary Zaboli, who also was the illustrator for uh, uh, Iliad. And, uh, you know, I said, well, we, we, we gotta have a cover. And I said, well, I'll, I'll show you the artwork I I have, and I knew this wasn't going to be the cover, but it, it was a very compelling 
uh, piece of art. And so uh, we mocked up a cover. And uh, I, I think this is still on the internet, but no, no that's not the cover. Uh, but that's what you have to do in the wonderful world of publishing sometimes. The book is, compared to everything else we've talked about, it's a, a small story, but it's such a great time capsule yeah. um, that about a place and a time, um, Houston around 1837 and 1838, and it is, it, it's a great picture of the uneven justice in uh, that early Texas. Well, the historian in me wanted to write a book about Houston during its time as the capital of the Republic of Texas, because it was a a wide open town. It, it, it made uh, Deadwood uh, look like a Girl Scout encampment. Uh, and I knew I wanted to write a, a, a book about Houston, but I also knew that uh, I didn't want to do the standard academic uh, treatment. Uh, uh, the Congress of Texas, Republic of Texas moved the Capitol in November of, of 37 by the, the or 36 by, by January of, of 37 settlers were, I mean, I didn't want to do. So how am I going to tell this story? And I was uh, going through uh, old issues of the, uh, Southwestern Historical Quarterly. It was, it was one that I found a, an issue that was published the year before I was born, 1952. And Andrew Forrest Muir, uh, who uh, I have enormous respect for. He, he didn't write a lot of her, but he was a, probably the best editor uh, Texas uh, ever produced. He taught it a long time. Professor at Rice. At Rice. And uh, he had found this diary of uh, a young Kentuckian who, who uh, was a lawyer by profession. And he comes to uh, Houston and has wonderful descriptions of champagne breakfasts and balls that he goes to and people he meets. And, Apparently he knew everybody, but he was involved in uh, a grave robbery. And, and writes about it like I, I might say, well, you know, I bought some new socks today. It's very matter of fact. And, uh, you know, this was a, this was a part of, um, the Republic of Texas that I'd never known about. And I, I suspected most people hadn't. And so that's how it earned the title Texian Macabre because it is, it's, it's pretty gruesome. And the, the young man who is executed, uh, there's a delicious irony. He, was an escapee from the Goliad massacre. And because of that, uh, and later fought at, at the Battle of San Jacinto, had all sorts of adventures, but he ended up in Houston, Texas, and he uh, murdered a fellow. And he was tried and hanged along with another murderer. But one day short, of the day two years before that he would have died at the Goliad massacre. And the fact that he was a Goliad massacre, well, the, the, the night before he was hanged, the, the upper crust of Houston had a ball celebrating 
the Goliad massacre. Now, I thought that was weird. I mean, <laughs> and it speaks to the different sensibility of people in the 19th century. I mean, yeah, you might observe the date, but to have a ball. So they, they celebrate his comrades and the next day they hang him. You know, it cuts no must. And, and I argue in the book, that one of the reasons that they hanged him was, was not uh, in spite of, but because he was a war hero, because he was a, a member of a, a, a criminal underclass there in, uh, in Houston called the Rowdy Loafers. And people come to me and say, Steve, or that's Rowdy Loafers, that's great. I said, look, I, no, no, that's, I didn't make that up. That's what they called. So they wanted to send uh, a message to the rowdy loafers. Uh, if, if we hanged David James Jones, who was a bona fide war hero, what do you think we'll, we're going to do to you? So you, you, you'd better, you know, if you ever go to Houston, you'd better walk right. You'd better not gamble and you'd better not fight. You know? Uh, so, which, by the way, I, I, I put that passage in the, uh, at the beginning of the epigram. But uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's true crime. It's, uh, it's got a murder mystery. It's a great story. It's a great story. And I, yeah. and, uh, I and the book just wrote itself. And uh, I've never had more fun. Recent, I, I had, I, I was up at the Texas State uh, Library and Archives researching the book. And my good friend, uh, Donley Bryce said, uh, Steve, I, I think I've got some documents that you're gonna wanna look at. And boy, was he right. And, and, and kudos, to, to Donnelly because I would have never found this on my own. You know, a good archivist is worth his or her weight in gold. Boy, he did me a solid this day. And a great guy too. He's oh, a just great. a wonderful guy. I miss him. He's still with us, but he's retired. You know? Yeah. And I, every time I go in there to do research, I, I say, oh man, I wish Donnelly was here. But um, he, he, he gave me the sheriff's expense account. Now the sheriff was the guy who actually was responsible for seeing that the, that the execution went off without a, a hitch. And uh, he was under a lot of pressure because this, again, this was a signal and uh, there were between two and 3,000 observers uh, at that hanging. It, it was a big deal. And, and one of the reasons that, that it was a big deal, it's not, it's not every day you get to see a war hero swing. So um, I'm, I'm reading his expense account and he comments that, that neither one of these people who are being executed had a pair of socks. And so he dipped in to his own pocket to buy the condemned a pair of socks so they would have a decent appearance, uh, not on the scaffold, they were on the, the back of a horse cart. Mm -hmm. and they, erected gallows, put them on the horse cart, put them running in the horse cart. But I, again, that 19th century sensibility, which is so different than our own, he, he, he says, well, you know, propriety dictates that these guys have a decent pair of socks on the day they die. Of course, he wants to be reimbursed and, and was, but, uh, you know, that, you know, it's that, kind of detail that makes history come alive 
and, and also makes us aware that these people aren't like us. They, they, view, they viewed their world through an entirely different lens. And, uh, you know, I, I sometimes lose patience with, well, it really doesn't matter which period of history you're talking about. People are all the same. No, they're not. No, they're not. How could they be? These people didn't have penicillin. You know, you could cut your finger and die. These people didn't have ATMs. These people didn't have microwaves. They, these people didn't have central heating. No, these people were fundamentally different than we, and, and that's why, well, that's why I study history. To, to try to understand the ways they were different. That's, that's what I find fascinating. And that's what I find fascinating about this book. But you know, I still don't think that book has sold uh, 5,000 copies. Well, it needs to. Oh. I, I, I agree. I, I think, again, you, you don't know why, you know, I've, I've, I've said halfway joking that if I had it to do again, uh, I would uh, say Texian Macabre, a, a book about a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who died at the Alamo. And then I'd put the Alamo on the cover. Uh, it, it, it had sailed then, but you've got this great story, this great uh, bizarre, you know, kind of Halloween tale that involves uh, body snatching and decapitations and hangings, and uh, it's 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 got everything, but uh, it didn't have the Alamo on the cover. So there you are. So from a small story, next up is lust for glory which is another comprehensive kind of thing how tell me how this book came about and how the title came about uh well i i, I talk about it in the uh, in the introduction uh i had been asked to put together uh a course an online course for Shriner University. And the course I put together was Texas Revolution and Republic. In fact, if you Google Stephen L. Harden, Texas Revolution and Republic, it'll pop up at 60 lectures. Uh, they're about uh, 12 minutes a piece. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that lecture series. You can watch them, they're free. Uh, if you want college credit, you know, it's, you know, they charge you for the credit, not for the information. You know. But uh, uh, my friend, Don Frazier, is a very effective off the cuff speaker. And I'm not, I'm, I'm somewhat anal retentive. So each one of these lectures, I would, I would write them out. I wrote the, you know, edited them and everything. So uh, we're in the studio shooting. And uh, I thought, uh, you know, when, when we got the lectures in the can, these would just go in the trash can. And Don pulled me aside and he said, Steve, you've got enough material here for a book. And we happen to operate a, a publishing firm, State House Press. He said, you know, if we publish this as a book, it would be a good companion for, for the people who are taking the course. It could be a companion book. And uh, boy, is it. it. It is basically the transcripts of my lectures. I've changed it up a, a few ways for, uh, for publication. 
But uh, it, what it does is it covers uh, that 25 year period between 1821, which is a pivotal year in both Mexican and Texas history, because that's the year Mexico uh, finally gained its uh, independence from Spain. And it's also the year that the first Anglo colonist came into Texas and begins the Anglo settlement period. And it uh, ends in 1846 with Texas annexation. So I, 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 I thought this is, this is the heroic age of, uh, of Texas history. And uh, Don thought, and I thought too, that uh, this would be uh, a good book, not, not necessarily for academics, because academics probably already know all of this, but for uh, new Texans and old Texans who, you know, it's been a long time since seventh grade Texas history. So I wanted, I was interested in making this book uh, as ex accessible to, to a wide readership. In fact, I worked with an editor uh, to take out, take out all my highfalutin professor words, you know. And uh, hey, I have a PhD, I, I know all those words, but uh, you don't always have to use them. And I didn't want to have this, you know, my professor vocabulary be a, be a barrier. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I think the tone of this book is probably a lot different than some of the others I've written. Uh, I was uh, surprised. Uh, when it uh, was awarded the Summerfield G. Roberts Award. Uh, it was the second time I had been so honored. Uh, Iliad also won uh, the Summerfield G. Roberts Award. Uh, it is an award given by the Sons of the Republic of Texas. It's a very prestigious uh, award. It's given for the best book on the subject of the Republic of Texas. Uh, it comes with a very nice certificate and a check for $2,500. So, uh, you know, uh, very nice. Uh, you know, an awards luncheon, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that book has been well received, but, uh, but again, hasn't sold near, nearly as many copies as Iliad. And, I, and uh, you know, there's not a footnote to be found in it. But, uh, but I was very gratified that the Suns uh, gave uh, the Summerfield G. Roberts Award to me uh, a second time. You used the word highfalutin, and uh, that could be applied. The last book that we're gonna talk about is Houston Displayed. And the subject matter is one thing, but the the quality of the book is kind of highfalutin. It's uh, this beautiful, very limited edition. Yeah, and that's book. one of the reasons I wanted to do it. Uh, this, it's part of the Library of Texas. And the Library of uh, Texas is a series of, uh, classic Texas books that are reprinted uh, by the DeGaglia Library at SMU. And they uh, all have, uh, are, have scholarly introductions and uh, are annotated, edited by uh, scholars who are noted in their field. And uh, they're all kind of fine press books. Uh, the editors get no royalties. Uh, I, I will never see a dime in royalties. Uh, and, and you know, 
editing uh, important primary works is, uh, I think, an important part of the historian's job. Uh, and I found, in fact, I discovered Houston displayed or, or who won the Battle of San Jacinto. It was ghost written by a guy named Robert M. Coleman. It was published in Velasco in 1837. Uh, soon after Sam Houston was elected uh, president of the Republic. And Coleman uh, did, did not like uh, Houston. And uh, this book, that, well, it's not a book, it's a, it's a, it's a 38 page pamphlet, small print. And uh, the premise of the book is that Houston didn't want to fight the Battle of, of San, San Jacinto and would not have if the rank and file had not forced him to. And uh, this is not a well-known pamphlet, but when I discovered it researching Iliad, lo, those many years ago, I thought, God, there's some dynamite information in here, and there's some information in this little pamphlet that I haven't seen anywhere else. So I pitched the idea to the folks up at the Gallier, and they said, yeah, we'd like to do it, and we want you to be the, you know, write a, a scholarly introduction that places the, uh, the pamphlet in context, and I did. The, the, my scholarly introduction is actually longer <laughs> than the pamphlet. And, and my annotations, I have about 140 of them. And sometimes the annotations take up most of the page. But it's uh, unlike um, Lust for Glory. Uh, this, this is a deep academic dive. Um, but I, I hope, uh, you know, all of the Houston biographers uh, have pretty much ignored this little pamphlet because it's biased. And yeah, it's biased, but what I discovered and what I think I've made clear in my annotations that uh, uh, does, does Coleman have an entire wagon load of axes to grind? Uh, yes, he does. But having said that, uh, nine times out of 10, he tells the truth. And his truth is corroborated by other veterans. So it's not just Robert Coleman uh, crying in the wilderness. So I, I, I hope uh, people will rediscover this uh, this pamphlet, and I and I hope that my scholarly introductions and my uh, annotations uh, convince people that if you're going to write a book on Sam Houston or the Texas Revolution, you ignore this little pamphlet at your peril. We're going to close with a shameless plug about the project you and I did together. That uh, that hopefully is not done. Um, it was designed to be an eight-part documentary series, feature-length films that run from in the two to three hour range mm -hmm. um, to teach Texas history. The time period is the same as Lust for Glory. Actually, it starts before that. It's, it's Yeah, we, we have a, actually do Spanish Texas, yes. so Spanish which, Texas, which I think is one of the better episodes. Oh, absolutely. Um, Spanish Texas through statehood. And we're trying to get the, the money to do the last episode which is already filmed we just need to edit it neither here nor there so the closing question for you is why is texas history still important to be taught well mike because we live here and if you're gonna live in a place uh, 
was it was it uh, Socrates who said uh, an unexamined life is not worth living? If you have no understanding of the place you live in, you're you're living a diminished life. And Texas has a distinctive culture. And, and when we talk about Texas exceptionalism, and some people bristle when I use just Texas exceptionalism, I, Harden, you're such a Texas chauvinist. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're so pompous. You're so blah, blah, blah. I says, no, 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 no. Listen, when I say Texas exceptionalism, I'm not saying that we're better than anybody else. And I know that you, you, you should meet some members of my family. Uh, we're not better, we're not braver, we're not, you know, what we are, what we are is we're different. We're different from people from other states, from other countries. We're different in, in quantifiable, identifiable ways. And if you want to test my theory, just, just drive over to Louisiana. Now, they're one of our closest neighbors. But they're nothing like us. We're nothing like them. And I, you know, I'd love to go to Louisiana. Uh, but they ain't like us. Uh, I went to school, uh, graduate school with a young lady uh, from Colorado. And uh, when she arrived in Fort Worth, she suffered. I mean, suffered terribly from culture shock. And I sort of used her as a test case because I, you know, I was a native Texan. She, I wanted to get that perspective. And I, I said, Suzanne, what makes you so uncomfortable about us? And she says, well, for all of your vaunted friendliness, and you are, you're, you're, you're friendly, you know. And when you meet uh, a Texan or Texans, they're all always very, Celeste is always very friendly. But there's always the inevitable question. Where are y'all from? And your answer to that question brings a different response. Because if you say Amarillo, or if you say Abilene, or if you say Waco, or Houston, or San Antonio, you're going to say, well, do you know my friend? You know, But if you say, I'm from Idaho, or I'm from Michigan, she says, and it's, and it's uh, she assured me it's nothing that was said. But she said, you could see it in the eyes. Oh, OK. You're not one of us. You're not a member of our little club, well, not little club, big club. Uh, and she said, it's very subtle, but it's there. And uh, I've thought about that. I think that's true. Uh, I think it's something that we Texans probably need to work on. But I, I do think we have a distinctive culture. And the reason we have a distinctive culture is because we have a distinctive history. And that history has shaped us. It continues to shape us. And uh, man, if, if and, 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 you know, I, I'm a history teacher, I've heard this. Well, history is boring. If, if you are bored by Texas history, 
Well, maybe, maybe you're not reading my books. You're definitely not paying attention. Right. Uh, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Harden and Mike, so much for helping us out this evening. Uh, this has been a delightful hour plus. Uh, I want to say this is one of the most enjoyable History at Night recordings that we've done uh, that I've personally enjoyed. I just wanted to take a quick minute to uh, thank some our friends of the San Felipe de Austin State Historic Site, our museum staff and support in Austin with the Texas Historical Commission, and especially Mr. Steve Fly, uh, who helped to underwrite this evening and bring Dr. Hardin to speak with us here in the museum and also uh, online through this recording. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, please do. The museum is available uh, at the moment. We're open Wednesdays through Sundays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we've opened our brand new Via de Austin, uh, which is a must see for anyone in the state. For more information, visit us at www.visitsanfelipedeaustin.com or uh, come on by or check us out on Facebook or Instagram. And thank you both so much for your time and, and for your thoughts. Have a good evening.